So I get to go first. Millicent uh, assured me that going first was just like zip lining. So for what relation that has. So um, glad to be here, though. Um, you know, when we talk about sustainability, one of the things that we typically will think of is how do we, th how do we make things more efficient? How do we reuse the things that we have um, and things of that nature? But some of the things that we, we tend to lose sight of is what are some of the enabling technologies that get developed that allow us to shed energy, reuse, have more control, things of that nature. So Adam Power set out to do that. We've created a circuit breaker that is enabling sustainability and at an incredible scale, much more so than we've ever seen before. Um, so to get started, I'd like to go through a quick story. This is my own story and how I got started in creating Adam Power. So my background is about 22 years in the electrical construction and engineering spaces. I actually spent the first five years of my career as an electrician in the field with a hard hat and tools before I decided to go to UNC Charlotte. Uh, just for proof, there's a picture on the screens. That's me there uh, in a hard hat and overalls uh, beside a Caterpillar generator that's getting ready to go inside of a, one of the buildings in uptown Charlotte. So this is all I know in life. Um, is electrical power distribution. But I feel I know it okay enough to, um, to make some, some really good changes in the world. Um, and one of the things I wanna bring up is, with regards to that, is about two weeks in the trade uh, at the age of 18 years old. I actually got to witness something like this on the project I was working on. And that is a three-phase fault. Um, you know, commercial industrial power is all three-phase usually at 480 volts, sometimes greater, sometimes less. And that's an arc flash event. And at the time, I, this is before Windows 95, but I thought that technology was further along than that, that you didn't have things that just blew up. Um, it turns out it wasn't true then, and it's not true now. So I did my own investigations at that time and just saw what was actually involved in the world of power distribution. And what I found were that really what's limiting us is actually the circuit breakers. Um, so I found some problems with circuit breakers. Um, and why circuit breakers? Because all of the power that we depend so much on that we use every day, whether it's in this building, on a ship, on an aircraft, all go through a lot of circuit breakers. It's what protects the circuits, right? So I found some problems. A couple of them are that Circuit breakers are very difficult to control. They're usually not remotely controllable. In other words, just like this that you see here, they're operated with a lever, like you'd see at your house. And also they're static. This is something we're not used to. So that circuit breaker that's 100 amp up there will always be 100 amp forever and ever and ever, and there's nothing we can do about it. But problem number one is that electricity is dangerous. There's one death per day in the US. And if it's not life and death that's a concern, it's the destruction that can be caused by short circuits, um, whether they're on ships or in buildings. So think of, from a sustainability and an efficiency standpoint, what about the inefficiencies from downtime, from destruction, from life and death, and things like that? So we decided to create a new circuit breaker called the Atom Switch. It's a solid state circuit breaker. So what does solid state mean? Solid state means that it is uh, semiconductor based. We're switched, we switch with, um, transistors, power transistors, which allows us to digitally control the product as well as to change its characteristics. We want to go a little bit further and make it intelligent, self-aware, to know what it feeds in the world, but also to make it faster than anything in the world. This is actually the fastest circuit breaker we know of. It's around 20,000 times faster than most circuit breakers today. So what does that have to do with anything? The biggest problem in safety in electrical systems is that the circuit breakers cannot move fast enough. They actually can't interrupt current flow fast enough to prevent the explosions we see, the arc flashes that we've seen. But to go a little bit further, we had to make the full slew of products. So we made the Atom switch, the circuit breaker you see, the Atom panel, and the Atom OS, which is the user interface that you use to change the characteristics of the circuit breaker. So the circuit breaker, the atom switch, that particular one is 100 amps. It can be dynamically changed anywhere from 10 to 100 amps. Remotely controlled, has all the metering built into it. 
Um, you can change its characteristics from a time current characteristic. It has all the ANSI relays. If you're an engineer, you'll appreciate that. But what probably the best thing to do is to show you a quick video. I apologize for the shakiness of this video. It's not as well done as the last one. Uh, it's only two minutes, so it does demonstrate the power of what we have done here. So I'll kind of narrate this as best as I can. This is, um, so this is our atom panel, and those are atom switches within our atom panel. So we're going to do a couple things. First of all, there's no more levers, right? No more mechanical stuff. You just press buttons to turn a circuit breaker off and on. We have a, uh, there's our Atom OS. So it actually shows you what's in front of you. So you can see a panel there, and then you can drill into the panel, and it shows you what's in the panel. And then you can give, do simple things, like let's give the panel a name. Uh, you can tell it what's, what its voltage class is. It'll know if something's wrong based on that. You can turn off and on remotely. So green is on, the pinkish color is off, although it's red in real life. For some reason, this came out pink. Um, and then you can name your circuit breakers. So we'll do some simple ones, call it motor number two. And we use electronic ink, some inspiration from the Kindle. So the image always stays there no matter if you lose power. We'll change the amp rating. So it was a 50 amp circuit breaker a minute ago. Through software, we make it 85. Today, that's a hardware change. So we have all the metering built in. We have volts, amps, KW. This video is a little bit old, so it doesn't show like we're doing temperature, KVA, uh, many other things right now. So we're going to crank this up to 100 amp. And you see the wires on the output, sorry, the wires on the output there, that's a three phase short circuit. That explosion we saw earlier was that situation. And that was it. It actually turned on and tripped faster than anything in the world. Now, for the safety standpoint, we have about 10,000 amps available in our lab. So I got the uh, short straw and uh, grabbed the bare wires. And we're going to turn that same circuit breaker on, which would normally cause third degree burns. And that's it. That was the same circuit breaker that actually started that 10 horsepower motor earlier. So you think about it. We have a product now that has everything built into it. Um, I didn't get to show a whole lot of that because I'm limited on time. But basically, going back to the sustainability, in electrical systems today, we buy the circuit breakers and we buy all this, uh, I lost the slides it looks like. Do I press a button to get them back? Okay, there we go. Um, so I'll talk about this in a minute, but we buy all this stuff. So we buy circuit breakers and we buy the power distribution and then we buy additional stuff to put on top of it just so we can see the power consumption, just so we can have some control over lights, over receptacles, over motors, things like that. Then we buy these things called ANSI relays to have over voltage protection, under voltage protection, under frequency protection, all that stuff where it's all built into a singular product. So this product enables sustainability. Um, because now you can remotely control. Now you can have a building management system or a ship management system or change your characteristics without building additional hardware. Those are all efficiencies that we are enabling. Um, this market is really small from a manufacturer standpoint. There's five really in the world um, that are in this market. It's a $40 billion market in the US alone. $15 billion of that is in circuit breakers, uh, panels, and switch gear, so the space that we're in. We have uh, four patents, uh, two are design patents, two are utility patents. Um, we have partnerships with the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, UNCC. Um, there's an interesting dynamic uh, in North Carolina right now. So UNCC is very systems level based, uh, power systems. We are closely aligned with NC State University in Raleigh. NC State does very, very well at the device level innovation. Since we are using power semiconductors, specifically silicon carbide, a lot of that's coming out of Raleigh. Cree, if you're familiar with Cree, um, is, is one of them, as well, as well as others. And the Department of Energy is keenly interested in the advance of these semiconductors because they realize that these are changing the face of power conversion and power distribution throughout the world, specifically what's called wideband gap semiconductors, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, um, which is what we use. So there's a close connection there with UNC Charlotte, NC State University, and the Department of Energy. Some milestones. This just kind of shows you the evolu evolution. We started in 2014. 
Our alpha product was created in 2015. Uh, beta product, which you saw in the video, was the first half of 2016. To, the second half of 2016, this is our release candidate, which we actually took to UL. So we've made both AC and DC models of this, not models, sorry, products of our Atom switch. In 2017, we're going to UL listing in February, uh, and we also have an 800 amp version coming out. So we picked up some funding along the way, uh, about 1.7 million, if I'm doing the math correctly, um, and with some additional uh, in the future. Just to go back to that UL dry run, uh, dry run, what does that mean? So before you go to UL, UL is really expensive to go through. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we had everything we could get right, right before we went to UL. So we paid some money to go into a UL lab and then to do most of the testing. There were some things we took away. We had to fix some things. That's why we're going back to UL in February. But we interrupted 100,000 amps of fault current with our circuit breaker, which I brought a sample here today. The TSA loved this, by the way, on the plane. Uh, they took it out of my bag and they said, you know, that's the coolest looking circuit breaker we ever saw. Um, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> but they, um, yeah, they did question me about this. But 100,000 amps through this little fellow here, uh, which is amazing. Most Circuit breakers that are able to withstand that amount of current are a lot bigger and a lot more expensive than this. We can actually interrupt 200,000 amps, which is the upper limit for any building, uh, at least in the US. And, uh, but the UL lab didn't have the capacity to do that, so we did 100,000 amps, um, which was pretty amazing. So as you can see in the picture there, our little circuit breaker is sitting inside of our panel and you can see the blasts and burns from other circuit breakers that have blown up in the past uh, in this lab. Also, our firmware was approved. So this is all software controlled. UL approved our firmware. This is an enormous task. Um, to have firmware approval, software approval for a life safety device like this uh, was a tremendous undertaking that's, taking us, that's taken us a lot of time and energy to get to. So we're very happy about that. Um, marine applications. So mostly we, spoke, we focused in buildings. The marine, marine applications are just as powerful. Both AC and DC power distribution, all the capabilities of being able to remotely control, to set up routines, to see all the metering, to change the characteristics of the power system, all apply to marine applications just like they do buildings. Day two, we see this as shoreside power. So um, we feel that this, there's, a, there's a tremendous application in shoreside. That's usually more medium voltage. Right now, we're doing 600 volts and less. Um, but the architecture we've created scales upwards. So we can use the same architecture uh, from a control standpoint and a, um, and a uh, chemistry standpoint to go up to higher voltages. Now, we, um, we pay close attention to meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we feel we meet about seven right now with our products. We probably meet more as a company. We are tightly integrated with our community. We try to source locally. Um, we try to do things as efficient as we can, uh, such, and, and, and to not use any hazardous materials. Everything we do is Rojas compliant. Um, and we go a little step further than that to try to develop the ways that are going to have less of an impact on the environment as we develop our products. We are very much focused on this. So we're here today to talk, uh, to, to pitch uh, for a $100,000 uh, award, and I think that uh, we've thought very much what we would do with that. So what we would do with that was to apply that to design modifications for our product to be able to be implemented in marine applications. Along with that goes uh, you know, some prototyping, having UL uh, review, um, do a construction review of our product to see that it will be UL compliant, and uh, to build prototypes and then build a beta for commercialization. That's essentially what we would do with the funds. Our team, uh, we have an awesome team. So like I said, I've got around 22 years uh, of experience in the electrical construction engineering space. Co-founder Dennis Carusis has a PhD in power electronics. The rest of our team is just great. Fantastic team. So this is changing the world. Fastest circuit breaker, most intelligent. It's equivalent from going from the rotary phone stage of the circuit breaker to the iPhone stage. So I encourage us to imagine something different in our power distribution. Thank you. Thank you.
So we'll take questions, but let me start with one. And this goes back to my earlier comment about understanding. Uh, so help me understand, because I'm not an electrical engineer. I get the safety, uh, but when you take out the variation and all of that, is there an energy savings? The, so it's not a, we don't offer a direct energy savings. We're offering what will enable energy savings. Got it. The ability to control at a mass level your electrical distribution system is enormous and is not possible today. Right. So, so, so it, in, it increases the f efficiency of a network or... That's right. Got it. That's right. So we're, we're cutting down the quantity of product and we're enabling the customers to actually have control of the entire system and not just parts of it. Fantastic. Questions? Yes, come up, Maria. This is fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, what, what I love about the solution is its uh, simplicity and, and it's, it's very elegant. But precisely because of that, I'm wondering why this hasn't already been done. Can you speak to that? They, it, it seems so obvious the way you lay it out and it, it makes a lot of sense. Why hasn't it been done and what might some competing approaches be? Sure. Um, there's some really good reasons why it hasn't been done. Um, the size of this breaker is this size today, and that's for 100 amps. Ten years ago, this would have been about four times the size. Um, silicone was the primary semiconductor for power electronics. With the advance of wideband gap semiconductors over the past seven years or so, um, wideband gap semiconductors are enabling technology to do this in a small form factor and really, really, really efficient. That's one. The other is the Internet of Things. Um, just simply having microprocessors that are real small, um, plug and play, very adaptable, open source communication, all those things kind of combined uh, enable it. Now, why hasn't it been done? There have been attempts to, to, there have been attempts in the past. They've primarily been with chemistries such as silicone that don't really allow it fundamentally. You know, at 92% efficiency, at form factors, four times the size of that, it's just not something that is... Um, that really sustainable. So it's kind of a combination of things. Plus, many of the manufacturers have enormous sunk costs right now in products that meet you well, and we've been using for candidly 80 years without change. So there, there's another reason. <laughs> Jeff, you had a question? If you have a question, just step up to any of the microphones and, and we'll take you in turn. Uh, you, answer, you answered one, which was it's Internet of Things compliant, or you know, possibilities are endless there. Part one of the question is how small can it go? So I'm thinking Internet of Things and distribution of sensors around the world. Is it, can, it be, can you take this technology and make it that small? So that's the first question. The second question, when can I get one from my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we're kind of, interesting question. We're actually in, in the, I guess the analog would be the Moore's Law of Power Semiconductors. Um, we are seeing smaller and smaller and oh, higher power densities. Uh, just in the, the two years we've been in business, we've seen that uh, the power densities double, the sizes get cut in half. There is a certain limit we're going to hit because you have to pass electrons, right, to flow current. So we're actually not going to get, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller like it's happening today, but uh, with, with um, you know, uh, computers, uh, you know, microprocessors. But um, it will get smaller. You know, I think that there's... Um, there's certain returns that, that aren't there. You know, you get to a certain size and it doesn't really pay off to get smaller and smaller. It's more about, um, you know, uh, fitting into a certain form factor that people are used to seeing. As far as residential goes, uh, we're not in the residential market right now. Uh, we actually were asked by many folks out there um, that are in the marketplace, when are you going to have something for residential? It's very hard to compete in residential. Residential is highly commoditized. Um, and the, there are value propositions there, but not most of them aren't there in the residential side. Most folks don't care about, you know, controlling their circuit breakers, really. I mean, maybe they do, but um, to pay, there, there is a premium, so that, at least right now there is. So. We're focused primarily on three phase, commercial and DC. We, we have one, one phase where if we have the washing machine going and use the microwave, <laughs> So, but people are interested in circuit breakers, believe me. So, uh, going along that whole line of questioning with home-related stuff, uh, if I have a $20,000 stereo system, 
there isn't any metal oxide barrister system that I could rely on that could really protect that. It seems like that could be a good entry level uh, product because you could go charge $500 for something that you could absolutely certify will never actually fail to protect that piece of equipment. Is that something you think you could go after? It, it, it is. Uh, it is actually. We're, we're, that's how we're approaching the UPS markets in particular. Um, you know, we, the, a good thing you bring up that I didn't have time to cover is that we, we prevent everything. Uh, short circuits, lightning strikes, we actually have surge suppression built in. Um, we are protecting under and over voltage frequency. All this stuff is built in to one product. I think there is an application because, uh, speaking of the sustain sustainability and efficiencies, UPS systems, for example, are built to withstand the maximum short circuit that they could see. So they're actually not right size. Power electronics, power conversion, the conversion from DC to AC, you know, from solar, wind, UPSs, batteries, things like that. We're actually enabling them to be right sized, to be able to be a lot smaller and a lot more efficient because we limit that fault so much that's, that's never been possible before. Mm -hmm. So then if you did have it outfitted for a house, you might be able to guarantee that no one in the house could get an electrical shock, right? That's day two. Day one, that's not the case. We, we don't have mm -hmm. shock and art flash are two different things. Um, we do not have that enabled right now, <laughs> but it is a possibility day two because what you bring up is, is a fundamental architecture that we've created that very much mirrors Tesla. Build the hardware to enable software enhancements day two. So it is possible, we haven't done the software algorithms to see the, you know, the reflected signal, to know that it's a sh shock, things like that. But it is possible, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how much outsourcing do you need to do to make that uh, component? Do you is it all made in another country? Or do you make it here? Or? We make everything on the, on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority is in North Carolina. You, including the chips and stuff? Including uh, the, 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 the microprocessor, no, those are all TI products, but mm -hmm. um, from the semiconductor, the power, let me bring this up here. From the power semiconductor uh, that's really located here, the silicon carbide, is all made in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next. Great presentation. Um, a question I had was um, that basically you are using a circuit breaker now to, it's kind of a variable circuit breaker which can adjust. But have you ever thought about energy monitoring? Because potentially, if you can control it, you can also monitor what's going through it. It's, it's built in. So or can that be used, uh, energy mo if you have energy monitoring capabilities, then you should be able to provide cost saving info as well? That's right. So is that a plan? Is that incorporated in there? Um, yeah. One of the things that we've incorporated is making the, so we have metering built in, um, volt, amps, KW, KVA, even temperature. Um, so no more, no more thermal scanning if, you, if you're in that, uh, in that space. But um, we want to, we have actually open sourced the metering, um, so, uh, the metering uh, data. So that, you know, the control of the device and being able to, Changes to characteristics is kind of one platform and then open source everything else. So all the metering can be um, sent out to whatever the customer is using from their building management system, their energy monitoring system. We want to integrate with other things. Um, there's, so, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of software products out there that do energy monitoring. We want to be able to integrate into most or all of them. Yes, do you have uh, lockout, tagout provisions built in? Yeah. So one of the things UL requires, I just kicked out this air gap disconnect in here. One of the things UL 489 requires is that you actually have a galvanic isolation, which is an air gap disconnect. Mm -hmm. So when we actually short circuit, have a short circuit or an overload, um, it kicks this, it, the power electronics, turn it off, this thing kicks out. And if you look here, there's actually a hole straight through it to where you can put a lock out, tag out on the device. Yeah. Excellent. Have you, have you thought about putting some capacitance in there and automatically switching in some capacitance to do um, help the motors? Yeah, so that's a power factor correction. Power factor. Um, yeah, we do have some in there. Uh, we haven't really thought about using that in, in that regard, but uh, we certainly could. Yeah, that's great. It point. might give you a little energy savings. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, another thing that most people don't realize is that traditional mechanical circuit breakers require maintenance and exercising. 
And that's something that I think in many cases simply isn't done today. Right. So that may be an additional sell for your product. Something it is. What's, thanks for bringing that up. What's neat about it is, is our semiconductors actually switch in 30 nanoseconds mm -hmm. maximum. So we can actually test the functionality, like kill the power, turn it back on while power is still on. And the customer never notices an interruption. So you can actually perform self-test and it actually turns it off and on before you, you know, it's not even perceivable. Good deal, thank you. Thanks. One more. Thank you for your presentation. And one quick question about cyber uh, threats, because you're talking about remote controlling and... Uh... Yep, okay, so um, we have, the way we set this up is we've used CAN bus communication, which is uh, an automotive protocol within the circuit breaker, within the firmware. That goes out to a gateway within the panel that then converts that to TCP IP, which is basically Ethernet. And the customer can use that or not. So folks can decide not to use the connectivity or they, or they can. Um, another thing is that uh, even if someone hacks into the firmware, which is virtually impossible with two layers of protocol such as that, even if they hacked into it, we still have hardware built into it that will never allow someone to change the characteristics that would cause destruction of the device or anything downstream from it. So all the safeties are built in both on hardware and software. Ryan, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Ryan Kennedy, Adam Energy. Thanks.